Hi, this is Jack Dondera, and I'm visiting the Ag office uh, today here in Manchester. And I'd like to share with you some uh, of the work that we've been uh, that we've been doing. And um, this relates to a software project called Slate, or software for linear algebra targeting X scale. So I'm at the University of Tennessee and the Oak Ridge National Lab. I'm also a physician here at the University of Manchester, and I'm visiting Manchester this month. So I'd like to talk about this package called Slate. So Slate is a dense linear algebra software package. It's intended to replace some of the software that um, perhaps you've been using, uh, IcePack, WinPack, LAPack, uh, which was really a replacement for IcePack and WinPack. And uh, Slate is intended to replace those packages as well as uh, Scalapack. So it's to provide you know, fundamental dense linear algebra capabilities for high performance computing. And its aim is to really extract high performance and maximum scalability from today's high performance machines. So we're really targeting at the large end of high end computing. Uh, looking at some of the most powerful machines and to provide them with a basis for uh, the linear algebra library. So this is not sparse matrices. It's uh, dense problems. It's uh, not intended to be for iterative methods, um, just for the dense uh, linear algebra problem set. And we've been involved in the design and development of software along these lines for the past 40 years. Uh, there was a package called IcePack back in the 70s. That was a Fortran package that uh, really was a translation of uh, many of the algorithms that appeared in the handbook uh, done by Wilkinson, Reinch, and colleagues. And uh, following that, there was a package called LinPack. LinPack was intended to solve dense problems and do it in a way which um, addressed um, machines that were cache-based and also had shared uh, memory parallel processing. The LAPAC routines uh, use the level three blahs in an attempt to gain performance from blocked operations. And um, it gained most of its performance from that. In the 90s, we took those ideas in LAPAC and developed them into a distributed memory version, uh, which was called ScalaPAC. And that used the communication layer called the PBLAs and within the PBLAs, all of the message passing or calls to MPI took place. In the, um, tur after the turn of the century, we replaced, uh, uh, we, we actually engaged in an experimental project to replace the routines in, in LAPAC with a version that would work with uh, multi-core or many-core processors, and that was called Plasma. And it was dealing with uh, tiled algorithms and uh, the ability to schedule things uh, uh, in a way which provided good efficiency. Uh, Magma was another experimental package designed to look at uh, how well we can push things uh, with respect to uh, GPUs or graphical processing units or really accelerators on systems. And uh, those packages uh, really don't work very well on high performance computing and the machines that we expect to see at exascale. So we're really looking at developing a library that will work at exascale, 10 to the 18 floating point operations per second. And in this case, we really have to think about machines which have uh, really billion, millions of uh, processors or cores in them and being able to uh, effectively run across that uh, suite of, uh, of uh, processors. Within the US, there's a project called the um, Exascale Computing Program. It's funded by the Department of Energy, and it really represents the biggest game in town in terms of looking at high performance computing and developing both hardware uh, uh, applications, software, and uh, algorithms for uh, Exascale-based computing. And uh, they're about to spend on the order of $3.6 billion over the next four years to put in place the hardware the applications, the software, and the algorithms that would effectively address uh, exascale computing. And they have a focus on the application areas. That's the primary um, mover or driver for this. Uh, there are 23 application areas uh, spanning the range of uh, energy, economic security, discovery, scientific discovery, earth science, and uh, healthcare. 
The funding uh, is uh, intended to, to mainly help provide uh, support for the Department of Energy laboratory scientists who are doing research uh, in this area and uh, those labs uh, are, are, are abs lot F or laboratories like Argonne National Laboratory, Oak Ridge National Lab, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, uh, Los Alamos, Sandia, Lawrence Livermore National Lab. And a few universities are also involved in this exascale computing project, trying to develop, again, applications, software, and uh, algorithms that work uh, at this level. So this project uh, is uh, not really a research project, it's a development project. That is to say, it's a project which has uh, deliverables, milestones, and is intended to provide, at the end of it, software that will run on these uh, large systems. So it's quite different than just an exploratory project, uh, trying out new ideas, perhaps uh, failing and carrying on. Here we have to produce something which is quite uh, useful in this range. The Department of Energy has a roadmap for its uh, systems that it intends to run at exascale uh, today uh, in the 19, in the 2018 and 2019 timeframe. There are two very large machines, uh, one called Summit at Oak Ridge National Lab and the other called Sierra at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Those are IBM systems which have NVIDIA accelerators. There's a couple of more machines that will be deployed um, next year, 2020. And the first exascale machines are intended to appear in the year 2021. So there's a machine going in place at Argonne National Laboratory called Aurora or A21. It's uh, built by Intel and now uh, HPE. Uh, and uh, following that will be a machine at Oak Ridge National Lab, which will have uh, AMD processors with an interconnect that uh, is supplied by uh, HPE. And then Lawrence Livermore National Lab will have a machine. Uh, they haven't announced yet uh, what that uh, vendor uh, will be that will provide that equipment. Those three pieces of hardware, very large computing systems, each running at exascale, are, uh, have a price tag of about $1.8 billion, or roughly $600 million per machine uh, over the next uh, few years. So a very large effort to develop hardware for solving some of the most challenging problems that the Department of Energy has. Uh, the current number one system is a machine at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. It goes by the name of Summit. It's an IBM machine. It has NVIDIA accelerators. It has a peak performance of around 200 petaflops. That's for 64-bit floating point arithmetic. It, each node of that machine has two IBM Power9 processors. Those have 22 cores each. And on that node are six NVIDIA Tesla uh, VT100 uh, GPUs, um, giving a significant amount of performance. The whole system has 4,600 nodes or about 2.4 million cores. It uses Mellanox as the um, interconnect uh, fabric uh, for that machine. But that's part of the story. The other part is that um, because of the NVIDIA processors um, and their ability to do 16-bit floating point arithmetic, this machine actually has a peak performance of 3.8 exaflops uh, when using that, uh, what I'll call half precision or 16-bit floating point arithmetic. The 16-bit uh, floating point arithmetic on the NVIDIA boards are there really to do uh, data analytics, machine learning, artificial intelligence-like applications. Those uh, NVIDIA processors are quite important to the overall performance of the Summit system. 97% uh, uh, of the system performance comes from those NVIDIA processors, and that's, uh, that number reflects the double precision uh, performance of that machine. And it has quite a few of those NVIDIA processors, 27,000 uh, 27, of those NVIDIA processors. Uh, NVIDIA has a street value of about uh, 15,000 for each of those GPUs, so it's a very expensive machine. Uh, with those uh, GPUs. But the GPUs are the really important thing and they have to be programmed too if you expect to get performance on this machine. So the Department of Energy has this exascale computing program. Uh, the software is uh, one of the aspects. Again, the applications are the driver. Uh, it, has, uh, it has intent to produce uh, software which can aid those applications in running. There's an application uh, software uh, stack and that software stack contains a number of key components. Mathematical libraries is one of those components. And uh, within the context of the, of the math software, 
uh, stack are a number of things, including um, uh, things like Petsy, Trolinos, uh, Super LU, and uh, Slate. Uh, so Slate, again, is this dense linear algebra library that we're intending to produce which will run on these exascale machines. And again, I want to stress this is not a research project. This is a um, software development project intending to put in place software that will actually run at scale uh, in production on those, uh, on those machines. I want to go back and take a look uh, historically at uh, what's, um, wh where we have been. So I want to look back in the 1970s. We developed a package called IcePack, which was a package for solving eigenvalue problems. It was uh, created from the algorithms in the handbook from Wilkinson Reinch. That software, of course, um, is fairly old, but it still works just fine on today's processors. And if we run the IcePack uh, software, in this particular case, we're looking at an example of running the uh, uh, singular value decomposition. And if we run it on a, a moderately uh, new um, uh, set of processors, in this case, it's Sandy Bridge, a few years old, uh, Sandy Bridge uh, in this configuration with 16 cores has a peak performance of 333 gigaflops in 64-bit arithmetic. When I run that ice pack code on that configuration, dual socket uh, uh, Sandy Bridge uh, configuration uh, with those 16 cores, I end up with a performance that looks about 0.8 gigaflops. So each core of this uh, Sandy Bridge is capable of 21 gigaflops and that ice pack software uh, is developing uh, very little uh, performance, uh, 0.8 gigaflops overall for computing the singular values. And when you compute the vectors, uh, you're able to get a little bit more performance around two, two gigaflops. So roughly 10% of the peak performance of one core of this machine, keep in mind that the dual socket has 333 gigaflops. So very poor performance It comes about because of the design of those algorithms in terms of software, the algorithms were written to access the matrix by row. These are Fortran routines, so column access is the preferable way. And uh, these routines uh, in IcePack did not have the benefit of the blahs, and uh, the compiler is the only thing that's there to extract performance. And the compiler does a very poor job of extracting performance and uh, running in parallel. So there's really no parallel processing that comes through the compiler so we're running at very, uh, very low rates of execution. If I uh, look at the next package that was developed in the late 70s, a package called IcePack, it has a singular value decomposition routine as well. And we can run that on that same uh, Intel uh, Sandy Bridge configuration. And now when we look at the speed up over the IcePack routines on that same platform, uh, we end up with the speed up that looks like when you're computing just the singular values, uh, speed up of around uh, three times what the ice pack routine uh, was able to perform at. And for the vectors, we get a speed up of about two uh, over what the uh, ice pack was capable of uh, producing. And that comes about primarily because of the level, because of the orientation of the codes. It's a Fortran code as well in, in LinPack. And now the codes have been restructured uh, in the uh, late 70s to access that data by column rather than by rows. And performance, uh, we get better performance because of uh, less uh, data movement. And these codes benefit from the level one blahs. That is, LinPack was designed around these vector operations, so we're getting some performance. But the performance is far from the uh, peak performance of the machine. The peak performance, again, was about 333 uh, gigaflops. We're running at about 10% of that peak performance. And when we, um, uh, when we switch to the next package, uh, LA Pack, which was designed in the early 90s, uh, that package was designed around uh, a set of routines to do blocked operations. And uh, instead of working with just vectors, we deal with um, rectangular blocks of the data. And we use the level two and level three blahs to, uh, to do the decomposition in this case. And in the case of LAPAC uh, on this uh, Sandy Bridge uh, set of processors uh, with one core, we end up with uh, speed ups of around five times that uh, that we saw on the uh, ice pack uh, routines. And when we uh, engage in parallel processing on this uh, set of processors, uh, we see even a more significant enhancement in performance running around uh, 35 times the performance of the ice pack routine. Now, these are all being run on the same platform, understand, just different versions of the code 
Uh, in this case, we're running with a Fortran uh, version. LAPAC was written in Fortran, calling on the level two and three blahs that have been provided by the manufacturers. And the comparison now is against the LINPAC code and the uh, ICEPAC code, which just has the, uh, in the case of LINPAC, just the level one blahs. In the case of ICEPAC, no, no particular blahs uh, were used in the production of that. Uh, of that uh, code. So we see significant enhancements in performance, but notice that we're still far from the theoretical peak performance of the Sandy Bridge processor, even given the block nature of these algorithms, and using something that was intended to run efficiently on a cache-based uh, system. We're getting uh, something which is on the order of just 10, uh, well, we're running 30 times what the ice pack routine uh, was running at, and that was getting around 10% of the uh, theoretical peak performance. So the environment that we have to develop our software in is one which is highly parallel. It uses distributed memory. It's uh, based on uh, computations on a node. We're going to use distributed memory. We're going to use MPI to send information between the nodes. And within the node, we're expecting to use uh, OpenMP as the uh, programming model uh, for doing the shared memory uh, within, within a given node. We're faced with heterogeneous uh, a set of nodes, that is, they're composed of commodity processors plus a, a GPU to accelerate uh, the uh, performance, to, to boost the performance, and that has to be taken into account in the design of the algorithms. Simple, sim simple loop-level parallelism is really too limiting to, um, uh, to use in this case here. Uh, if you take a look at Summit with uh, over over um, 4,000 4, nodes and uh, 2 million cores, simple loop level parallelism won't cut it. Doing fork join kind of parallelism is not going to get you much performance. You have to engage in something beyond that. Uh, there uh, have to focus on communication. It's a very expensive uh, part of the overall computation. Uh, it's more expensive in some sense than the floating point operations that are going to take place. We have to look at algorithms which go beyond the normal uh, 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 evaluation of just looking at the number of floating point operations, comparing algorithms just based on the number of floating point operations. We have to focus on algorithms which uh, may do, in fact, more floating point operations, but do the kinds of operations that can be optimized on a, an accelerator-based machine that really uh, use, perhaps, the capabilities of that uh, accelerator uh, to, uh, to run faster. And uh, we, we have to be aware that floating point arithmetic today is at 64 bits uh, uh, for double precision, 32 bits for uh, single precision, and this 16-bit uh, uh, floating point capability are half precision. And there's significant benefits in terms of the uh, performance that we can see. So looking at algorithms that can perhaps uh, use uh, that half precision to do part of the calculations and then to refine the solution using higher levels of accuracy to get a solution which is uh, a bit more uh, in lines with the 64-bit precision that we're working with. So that's what we're faced with or challenges in, in developing our software. One of the major changes that we've made to the structure of the codes is one that uses a data flow-based architecture. So instead of having loop level parallelism, we've engaged in uh, looking at tasks and developing a data flow model within the software to, uh, to structure the execution of the program. This is not a new idea. These are old ideas. And uh, the cartoon there on the bottom left uh, shows what happens with a loop level parallelism where you see gaps in the performance. The coloration is indicating productive work and the white space indicates where we're blocked waiting for something to finish. That kind of loop level fork join parallelism is the thing which leads to that kind of performance. And by scheduling tasks in a way which allows for this uh, uh, data flow-like uh, execution, you're able to compress a lot of that uh, wait time and uh, remove it and get something which runs a lot faster in the overall uh, scope of things. Just to um, refine that idea a little bit, uh, the algorithms in LAPAC uh, looked at doing operations based on panels. This is an example here of a, an algorithm which is decomposing a matrix into its, uh, looks like a Cholesky factorization, where we do a rank K update to a trailing part of the matrix there. That's that symmetric rank K update that's designated in orange in the bottom, uh, the bottom cartoon. 
And um, that's the way LAPAC would have framed the algorithm. With Plasma, we look at a more tile-based approach to this, trying to break things up into finer pieces, and then scheduling those pieces on the uh, overall hardware. So the, uh, the way the scheduling could work is shown here in this graph, where we have a synchronization points between them. But because we're working with a directed acyclic graph and we have a data flow approach, uh, we're able to compress that uh, structure, um, allowing more overlap between the loop up, the loop uh, levels, and allowing the algorithm to proceed more, um, more effectively, exploiting as much parallelism as possible uh, throughout the course, respecting the, um, the data dependencies and getting an algorithm which is, in fact, much faster. Uh, overall. So there's a critical path which has to be respected in that case. And then dealing with library routines, we're often faced with putting one routine, uh, uh, a sequence of routines together to solve a problem. This is an example here where we're looking at uh, finding the explicit inverse of a symmetric positive definite matrix. It could be used uh, in variance covariance uh, situations where we need to actually have elements of the inverse. We would do a Cholesky factorization followed by inverting that triangle L and then multiplying L transpose, the inverse of L transpose times itself uh, to get back to solution. And uh, the cartoon in the middle shows what happens on a 48 core system. You could see the, uh, the amount of work being very intense uh, uh, for those, uh, for those uh, data flow representation. But at the end of the computation, there's less work to do and it naturally trails off. What we'd like to be, what we'd like to do is to actually push those graphs together and end up with a graph which is more, uh, more in line with the data flow for the three approach, the three subroutines there, and uh, do it in a much more uh, efficient way. And we can, in fact, do that using this uh, structure that we have um, with the uh, Slate library. So the cartoon shows you the improvement that you would get uh, using this approach. Uh, of merging these DAGs together and uh, synchronizing uh, in less often, uh, causing the overall synchronization to occur. Within the scope of this project, we've developed um, a standard for looking at batched computations. So this is a community-based uh, standard. Um, we engaged uh, various uh, groups within the community to come up with a uh, calling sequence and uh, semantics for, for doing these batched operations. Uh, when we're doing our uh, linear algebra algorithms, we have the need for uh, doing a uh, number of small matrix multiplies uh, that can be done in parallel. Uh, it's, it basically results from doing that sure complement, uh, doing that outer product kind of operation. And uh, we're faced with many matrix multiplies that can be done in parallel. And we want to be able to do that rather than sequentially schedule them, do them in one group. And we also know of applications which need to do, let's say, multiple uh, SVDs uh, simultaneously. Uh, so they have a large set of uh, singular value decompositions of small matrices, all different, that can be done in parallel. And what we'd like to do is be able to batch them in one call rather than to have a loop around the SVD routine. Uh, the other case where this is coming into uh, is in deep learning, where uh, some of the intensive parts of those uh, of those uh, neural networks uh, deal with matrix multiplies. They have many, many matrix multiplies during the training session that can be done in parallel, and we want to be able to accommodate that. So just graphically looking at that, instead of doing one matrix multiply that we might have uh, uh, in a loop uh, for that uh, sure decomposition, what we would like to do is to present to the um, to the processor to the node a sequence of operations and let those uh, operations be scheduled across the node, getting a much more efficient and effective way of uh, exploiting the computation overall. So that's part of the batched uh, BLAS uh, standard. It's uh, it's in its final. Uh, form today. There's uh, a number of groups have contributed to it, and um, we're implementing that just to show what kind of performance we can achieve. Here's a case uh, with looking at uh, taking a batch, and the batches here are uh, matrices about 50 up to 1,000, looking at um, small sizes, medium sizes, and large sizes. And on this GPU, you can see a significant increase in performance 
when one goes from matrix, small size matrices, we get a factor of 30 in batching the operations just by doing the batching itself, rather than to running a loop around the matrix multiplies, uh, we're getting a factor of 30 improvement in speed on this NVIDIA uh, platform. So that's being rolled out. The other um, thing which uh, is important for um, uh, consideration now is, is using uh, mixed precision. That is, um, the IEEE is defined the standard for floating point arithmetic. It has 16 bit, 32 bit, and 64 bit floating point operations. The 16 bit floating point operations, uh, you could see the format there five bits for the exponent, 10 bits for the fraction. That has some limitations. <clears throat> the largest floating point number that uh, one can realize is the number on the order of 65,000. So any number larger than that would uh, overflow. There's also another um, standard that's being proposed. Uh, single precision uh, IEEE format looks like this with eight bits for the exponent, 23 bits for the fraction. Uh, Google has proposed something called uh, BFLOAT16, which uses that same number of bits for the exponent and uh, using only seven bits for the fraction. That gives the dynamic range of numbers uh, much greater uh, scope. Uh, we can now represent numbers up to uh, 10 to the 38, or roughly the single precision limitations, but it only gives that seven bits of uh, fraction to, to deal with. So I expect um, uh, we're going to see a number of algorithms uh, using mixed precision in the computations, and uh, we're planning to, uh, to structure things along those lines uh, with Slate. Just to push this idea further, uh, within the uh, NVIDIA uh, processor, the GPU, there are really four floating point operations uh, that one can perform. 64-bit operations, which have a peak of 7.5 teraflops. 32-bit floating point operations, which have a peak of uh, 15 teraflops. 16-bit floating point operations, uh, which uh, use that uh, FMA instruction, which double again the performance up to 30 teraflops. And NVIDIA has a four by four matrix multiply that can be employed. And that's uh, called the tensor core. Those four by four matrix multiplies have a peak performance of 120 teraflops. So you can see the advantage of using uh, short precision. If you can get away with it and you have matrix operations, uh, you can get at very high rates of execution. And there are a number of algorithms which can benefit from that. I'm not gonna have time to talk about those algorithms here. We're running short on time. Uh, so let me just uh, sweep past this uh, very quickly. Uh, so we can uh, we can sum up, but there's there's a bunch of uh, algorithms which use um, a technique called iterative refinement, which can uh, factor the matrix in short precision and then use this technique to improve the accuracy using higher precision. And it has the effect of uh, developing if the iteration converges and that convergence is dictated by the conditioning of the problem that you're trying to solve. If it converges you have the opportunity to run roughly four times faster than the 64-bit uh, 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 implementation and have exactly the same accuracy that you would have gotten had you done the computation in 64-bit. So that's a big win uh, that we have there. Just looking back in terms of uh, performance, uh, I began my career running on an IBM 37195 that was at Argonne National Laboratory. Uh, that ice pack routine uh, that I talked about at the beginning of the talk, uh, running on one core of the Intel Sandy Bridge processors is actually 435 times faster than that IBM 370-195. So uh, we've gotten a, a big improvement from the hardware, uh, but you know there's also been improvements from the software. So the plasma code that I mentioned uh, that uses this two-stage reduction is able to get another factor of 197 uh, over what we got on the ice pack code. So very significant enhancements coming about, uh, of course, because of the hardware, but also uh, because of uh, software innovations and algorithmic uh, changes that occurred in the algorithm, getting uh, uh, answers which are as good as those original answers uh, and doing it at a much, uh, much greater uh, speed because of the hardware, of course, uh, but also because of the software and algorithm advances that have taken place. So I think uh, I'd like to conclude at this point, I'm running out of time here, just to say that uh, over the past 40 years, we've seen uh, an evolution take place in the software, in the algorithms, 
following the hardware, uh, basically tracking the hardware, going from uh, sh really sh sequential based machines to machines which had vector operations, to machines which had uh, cache based systems, which did um, shared memory uh, parallel processing to uh, algorithms which use message passing to pass data between nodes, to hybrid algorithms which used uh, accelerators. And today we're putting all of that together in a collection of routines which do message passing, shared memory uh, within the node, explicitly uh, passing data and trying to exploit uh, those uh, accelerators that are there. So that's the uh, Scala pack, uh, sorry, that's the Slate uh, story. Uh, those packages, uh, the, the package we're developing today will have bindings to the LA pack routines and to the Scala pack routines. So a user who has software that uh, is today calling Scala pack or LA pack will be able to get the benefits of this Slate library without really making major changes to, uh, to their software. And let me just uh, conclude by thanking all of those people who have helped uh, with the software over the past 40 years. Here's a collection of people who, uh, who have uh, influenced the, the design of software and uh, helped things along over the course of those 40 years. And um, uh, uh, this project wouldn't have been possible without the help of uh, a, a great number of people, some of whom are listed here. So I think I'll stop there and see if there are any questions that have come in uh, uh, during during my talk or any new questions. So one question that uh, that was put together uh, is about uh, will this slate interfa interface uh, work well with uh, Petsy for applications that use both dense and sparse uh, uh, linear algebra? So the answer is yes, of course it will. Um, uh, you know we're going to define a uh, so if you have a mixture of both dense and sparse matrices, it's possible to use Slate. Slate's going to define a, uh, uh, an environment for uh, passing messages, and MPI has the ability to uh, define that communicator that Slate will use to pass information. Petsy, I'm sure, will have its own communicator for doing its way of uh, communication between, uh, between machines or between processes, and those, uh, those can coexist without uh, major changes. Let's see, another question here is how large, um, let's see, how, how would Slate interface with user developments, uh, making it easier, uh, and uh, can they use, uh, 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 can they replace calls to LAPAC and ScalaPAC? And uh, uh, the answer is yes, there's going to be an interface that allows one to do that with very, uh, very simple, a very simple way of, uh, of uh, doing business. So clearly it's possible to uh, interface to this routine. In a very simple, um, in a very simple way, uh, all the software is open source. Uh, it uses a BSD license. It's uh, community available. Um, you know, we're planning to uh, develop and to fix uh, problems with that software as they arise over time, and they'll be uh, pushed uh, out in various releases. We're we're expecting help from the community in terms of identifying and tracking down bugs. Uh, with we're planning to follow the same model that we have with uh, LAPAC, ScalaPAC, Plasma. There'll be a forum that's set up so that uh, people can uh, send in uh, comments and hopefully we'll get the community to help respond to that and to build up uh, uh, effective community from that. And let's see, we're looking at uh, extra questions here. I got to put my glasses on to see these. Uh, uh, Okay, in terms of energy efficiency, one question is about, uh, can I comment on uh, energy efficiency of uh, the routines? And, uh, you know, we're looking at energy efficiency. This optimization that, we, uh, that we're going to engage in is one which uh, has to have a compromise between a number of things, uh, time to solution, uh, how much communication you're doing, and uh, uh, clearly energy f falls into that, uh, into that mix as well. Uh, we want to be able to run our routines as uh, efficiently as possible and get you the best time to solution, and that, um, uh, that, that'll be done. So today we're carrying out experiments looking at uh, the energy uh, budgets and to understand if we can turn the, uh, turn the uh, let's call it the, the cycle time down or turn the cycle time up, increase the frequency uh, for certain, uh, uh, for d decrease the frequency of certain components that are doing, let's say, floating point, where we're doing things which are uh, taxed in terms of passing messages. The floating point 
is, uh, you know, floating point is done so fast today. Our machines are so over provisioned for floating point that uh, communication really is the limiting factor. And if we can overlap communication and computation, if the computation is the biggest bottleneck and we can't release that bottleneck, we can perhaps think about uh, turning the uh, uh, turning the floating point units uh, down and not having them run as uh, as a, as efficiently uh, to match the speeds of the uh, communication. Um, different vendor architectures, yes, uh, we're, we are looking at different vendor architectures in terms of of the API. Um, you know, we're writing all of our code in C plus uh, plus. We were intending to have a binding that would go to Fortran. Uh, and if there are other languages that are um, uh, that emerge, which which are needed, we would of course provide bindings for those other languages. Um, uh, another question is about uh, MPI, and do we want to stick to MPI on exascale machines, uh, not go to PGAS like uh, 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 implementations? Uh, so it's our intent to uh, have a have a library which will be based on message passing. That's the standard mode that we see these uh, Department of Energy machines having, and uh, we're developing a library there. But experimentation could be done with using a, a PGAS model or uh, uh, and, and looking at uh, what the trade-offs are of doing that. Um, will the GPU programming language uh, used on Frontier? Um, so the, the machine that um, that's coming to Oak Ridge is called Frontier, and it's based on AMD. And um, uh, the question is if OpenCL uh, uh, is, is going to be used or we're going to use a proprietary CUDA. So the way we really look at this is we're trying to encapsulate calls to the accelerator at a lower level so that the, uh, the user is never exposed to that, uh, to that level of the hardware implementation. Um, so we're going to program at, at a level which will call on vendor routines to get us the best performance. We're expecting the vendors to have implementations available of uh, certain key components like the BLAS, and we're intended to um, then call on them, whether they're written in CUDA or in OpenCL uh, from the standpoint of our library is really not going to uh, impact, uh, impact the user. Uh, so uh, in that sense, we're hoping to make things very uh, transparent uh, on the type of applications that require exascale computing. Uh, so the question is about which applications need uh, exascale computing. What's the uh, what list of applications really rely on exascale computing to uh, uh, to uh, to get their problem solved? And and there there are 23 applications that the Department of Energy has identified. Uh, those applications are described uh, on the ECP webpage. I, I'm not going to have time to go through uh, through them in detail, uh, but you know they relate to energy uh, energy related uh, topics, uh, things related to combustion, things related to materials, uh, things related to um, uh, uh, neutrons transports, things related to uh, as far away as uh, as um, uh, cancer research. Those are all part of this. Uh, Exascale program, and it's those applications which uh, which really are in need of uh, uh, very efficient, uh, high-speed computations, and uh, these machines are being deployed for those applications. And I guess with that, I guess we're we're off. So thanks very much.